Hello and welcome back everyone to our final guest speaker session of the day. I'm very excited to announce our speaker, Dr. Charles Brown, who is a professor of applied linguistics and TESOL and is a specialist in second language vocabulary acquisition. He's also the CEO of Charlie Brown Company, which helps online language learning companies develop science-based learning platforms, gamified teaching approaches and content. This is gonna be a great session and we're so pleased to have you here. Thanks, Charles. And whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Well, for me, it's really early. It's 4.45 a.m. So I will say good morning to everybody or good afternoon to you where you are. Uh, give me a moment to share my screen and then we'll begin. Okay, so let's see, share screen. Okay, window, here we go. Hopefully you can, can you see my PowerPoint okay now? Yes, we can. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you everybody uh, for having me here. It's a, re it's a real pleasure uh, to be with you, even if only virtually. Uh, my name is uh, Charles Brown and I'm a professor of applied linguistics at Meiji Gakuin University in Tokyo, Japan. I've been in Japan for uh, more than 35 years and uh, I'm a specialist in uh, EFL education, online learning, and especially uh, vocabulary acquisition. Um, you can see some of my free websites. I do a lot of uh, open source uh, uh, tools, corpus-based vocabulary lists, uh, learning tools, uh, extensive reading resources, and so on. Um, I'll introduce some of them in this session today, but for the ones that I don't introduce, you can see from, uh, from, the, from the links. So um, before I begin talking about my uh, vocabulary uh, resources, um, I, you know, just in keeping with the theme of the conference, um, I thought a little bit about uh, this, this great quote uh, by Ray Clifford, um, which says that technology uh, will not replace teachers, but teachers who use technology will be the ones that re probably replace those who do not. And this is a famous quote from probably, I don't know, it's gotta be 15 or 20 years ago. And we could, you know, potentially just update that. Uh, the people who are uh, teachers who are able to use OpenAI and ChatGPT are going to be the ones that are going to replace the ones who cannot. Um, technology is not going to replace teachers. We've been saying that since I was a kid. Uh, when I was a kid, it was about calculators. Um, and I love this, this, this picture this is back in the eighties, my math teacher used to say, you're not going to always have that calculator with you. And then every five or 10 years, it's either calculators, electronic dictionaries, uh, computer assisted language learning, uh, mobile assisted language learning, AI, and now chat GPT. And every five years, everybody gets, you know, alarm, all alarmist about it. And then five years later, that technology is part of, uh, the students daily lives. And so I think we need to think about how to embrace these technologies and help students students uh, to use them and to use them responsibly rather than try to prevent them uh, from using it. Um, for me, as a specialist in online language learning, um, you know, what I, what my, my starting point is always uh, pedagogy. Um, I, I used to work with Sony Language Labs, and Sony was all about selling very expensive computer systems and, and lab systems, but they didn't place much emphasis on, on pedagogy. They just thought about selling the most expensive technology to schools, and usually the technology ended up being unused. So the starting point for utilizing uh, technology or utilizing AI really has to be uh, pedagogy. You have to think about what you want uh, to occur in the classroom, what you want students to be able to accomplish. How can that technology assist that? And I think once you start thinking like that, then we can come up with some uh, very good solutions. Now, let me uh, begin by talking, begin talking about my own project, uh, which is called the NGSL project. That's the New General Service List, NGSL. And I'll get in more detail about that in a moment. But the New General Service List is actually an update of the Old General Service List. The Old General Service List is something that was published in 1953, but took more than 17 years. It was a word list um, that uh, in a pre-computer era where they had to create corpora by hand, it took them 17 years. And that list that they created was supposed to represent the words that EFL learners were most likely to encounter in their daily lives. And it was amazing. It was an amazing work because it was in the pre-computer uh, era. But um, it really was getting old. It was getting long in the tooth. And um, we uh, at the NGSL project uh, in 2013 on the 60th anniversary of the old GSL 
published a new version, an updated version based on a much more modern and, and larger uh, corpus. And we're now not just a one word list like the old project, which is old general service list. We are now seven, we have seven uh, open source corpus based word lists and each of them uh, gives the highest coverage in the world for that uh, specific uh, genre. And at the NGSL project, what we're trying to do is uh, to help EFL learners, uh, teachers and content developers and researchers uh, to be able to uh, deal with the teaching and learning of vocabulary in the most efficient and systematic way uh, possible. Um, so it's more, it's gotten to be much more than just uh, vocabulary lists. We're now developing uh, and utilizing uh, open source and free uh, learning tools uh, as well. And certainly AI is already a part of that in terms of content development, but pretty soon it will also be part of what we do in terms of dir direct teaching of, of, of the words. Um, the over the past 10 years of the new general service list, um, as you can see, uh, we're starting to have an impact around the world. Um, we've got over a million uh, hits on our website. Uh, we've got over a dozen online learning tools. We've got seven uh, free word lists. Um, I go around the world, um, including virtually this morning, uh, um, done more than 40 uh, keynotes or, or, or plenaries about uh, this project. I actually did a TED talk about this project as well back in 2016. Uh, now that the word list has been out there a while, there's more than 70 academic articles that utilize our word lists, uh, you know, in, in various ways for, for research. Uh, there's hundreds of citations of our word list, and now there's uh, countless textbooks and online learning platforms and apps that are utilizing uh, our word list because they're open source and free, and that's exactly what we want uh, to happen. Um, so... Uh, why vocabulary? Why am I so uh, focused in on this? And why do I think it's uh, so important? I love this uh, slide because it shows words as kind of building blocks. And I really do think of vocabulary as the, the, the building blocks of language far more so than uh, grammar or functions or other things that, that, that other you know, textbooks and other approaches uh, tend to focus uh, in on. For me, uh, the starting point was uh, being a student of uh, Dr. Paul Nation. And Paul Nation is, in a way, the father of, uh, of, of vocabulary learning, uh, or vocabulary as a second language uh, learning. And uh, he put out a book called Teaching and Learning Vocabulary when I was a graduate student, but I went on and did doctoral studies with him as well. And now learning vocabulary in another language is about 700 pages. It's, a, it's, it's like the Bible of how to teach and learn uh, vocabulary. And that's, that's a, you know, his thinking is a big part of uh, my approach. Um, so as I said, I think uh, vocabulary uh, is, is very important. It's the first step in language learning. It's, um, and, and I think it's very important to identify what are the core words, what are the foundational words, and that's exactly what the NGSL is. The NGSL are these, the, these core vocabulary words, the words that every uh, second language learner needs to learn, uh, the ones that they are most likely to encounter in their daily life. Um, I'm not sure if you ever thought about how big the English language is, but if you looked at the largest dictionary of English, uh, that's the Oxford English Dictionary. And in the Oxford English Dictionary, there's 600,000 uh, uh, entries. And that's, 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 a, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of words. Um, the question is, um, you know, how many of those words do we need to know? Um, have you thought about uh, the size of uh, a native speaker's uh, vocabulary size. Uh, how many of those 600,000 words, for example, would would I know? Somebody who's uh, a native speaker and, and graduated from college. Um, I was talking with somebody last night and they said, oh, must be half. You must know 300,000. Well, no, it's not. It's not half. The average adult native speaker only knows about 5% of the language. Uh, if, and that's for people who have graduated from college. For people who just go straight into work from high school, it's actually only about 20,000. So somewhere between 20 and 30,000 words is, is the target if you want to have as much vocabulary as, as a native speaker. Um, but actually, my focus is not native speakers. You know, I've been in Japan for 35 years. Uh, the, I'm, I'm the director of the teacher training program. These are all my students who are training to become English teachers. And so my focus is really on the needs of second language learners of English. And so the question is, how many of those 30,000 words that native speakers know do non-native speakers know? And in Japan, for example, where they, you know, English is a required subject, 
in elementary school, junior high school, and senior high school, even after 12 to 14 years of language study, they don't know 30,000 words. In fact, um, in Japan, after 10 to 12 years of study, they only know somewhere between two and 3,000 uh, words. And it's not only Japan, it's, it's many other countries in the world. Um, so problem number one is that, that second language learners just don't know uh, enough uh, vocabulary. But the second problem, and it's a related problem, is that the uh, English reading materials that second language learners use are far too difficult for them. And this causes a lot of problems too. And this is one of the reasons why I'm not only a vocabulary learning specialist, but I'm also a, a reading specialist, because I think these two areas are very closely uh, correlated. Um, so we said that, that Japanese um, students know about 2,000 words after 12 years of study. What can you do with 2,000 words? Well, if you know the 2,000 most frequent uh, words of English um, and you try to open uh, Time magazine, you would probably know about 80, 81% of the words on the page. That's, that's quite a lot, right? Um, and if you were to open a newspaper, uh, the, the percentage is even higher. Um, if you open a typical uh, daily like uh, Japan Times, you would probably know about 85%. Um, well, the, you know, the news gets even better if you try to read a novel, uh, the number one novel for second language learners in Japan, and I think in many other countries too, is Harry Potter. And if you were, tried to, try, if you were to try and read uh, Harry Potter and you knew 2,000 words, you would be able to read about 90%. And with our NGSL list, it's actually higher. It's about 94%. Um, so knowing these high frequency words can, can help you get a lot of coverage on native speaker materials. But the problem is, is that often uh, materials for second language learners of English are often, strangely, even more difficult than that. If you were to try and, and read uh, Japan's number one um, high school English textbook, New Crown, you would only get 75% coverage. Uh, so much lower than Harry Potter or Time Magazine or, or the newspaper, which is very strange, right? You know, why would you... Uh, make second language learning materials more difficult. Um, we can, we'll go into that in a, in a bit, but um, you might be thinking to yourself, well, 75%, 85%, you know, 90% doesn't, doesn't sound that different. Maybe 75% is enough. Well, this is what 75% looks like. If you were to try and read a passage, and this is a passage from a, an introductory um, college textbook about the topic of forestry, the study of trees. And if you knew 75% uh, of the words on the page, um, this is what it would look like. There would be 15 missing words. And we often tell our students, you know, please uh, read and guess from context. Well, there's your context. Can you, can you guess the missing words? It's pretty hard, isn't it? It's it's actually more than hard. It's almost impossible. 75% is not enough to be able to read easily. Would you agree? Well, take a look at what 95% looks like. Um, this these these red and yellow words are, are are the words that are that are filled in somewhere between the 75% and 95% level. If you knew 95% of the words, there's only one missing word there now. Um, then now reading is much easier. If there's only one or two missing words, you can read and guess from context. Uh, so what we have, um, and this is part of the research uh, that's very important to my work, is what's called uh, vocabulary threshold research. And what we can see, the first bullet point, is that below 80%, uh, reading comprehension is basically impossible. And you saw the 75% slide, it is almost impossible. Um, the good news is that once you hit 90%, 90% uh, is the point where there will be more readers than non-readers. That means about half of your students will be able to read and guess from context, but half will still be struggling. And 95% is the point where almost all of the readers will be able to read and guess from context without the help of dictionaries. And the, the, the level that a lot of people talk about these days is 98% coverage because that's the point at which students can and read for pleasure. But anyway, anything above 90% is, is, is where students can actually do something uh, with, with the text. And that's the goal that we shoot for at the new general project, new general service list project, is to get above 90% coverage at minimum for all of our word lists. Um, and that's 
the solution, right? This is all those are the problems, and the solution is is basically um, this corpus based approach to to language development. What we're trying to do with the new general service list project is to create shortcuts. Uh, for students. Instead of learning 30,000 words like native speakers do, learning much, much fewer than 30,000 words um, um, and, and being able to read and, and, and guess from context and to work without a dictionary and without the help of a teacher. So we're trying to create short lists of words that are enough for them to be able to understand uh, most English. It's about efficiency. And so the new general service list, our first list, which was published in 2013 uh, for review, 600,000 words in English, 30,000 words known by native speakers, 90% is the minimum to be able to read and guess from context. The new general service list is very short, only 2,800 words, um, and covers 92% of the words that students are likely to ever meet in the average newspaper, book, magazine, TV show, or movie, or, or daily speech. And that's, that's efficiency. That's, that's a lot of coverage for very few words, considering there's 600,000 words in the English language. Okay, so that's that's the new general service list. And this was created uh, with full access. Uh, we were able to um, uh, arrange access to the Cambridge uh, corpus, the CEC, Cambridge English corpus, which is one of the largest uh, corpora in the world. There's several uh, at, at this size, but this is a very well um, uh, curated uh, corpus. And there's a lot of tools to help us to dig in and, and to choose the sub corpora that we thought would be representative of what second language learners need. And you can see on the left-hand side uh, some of the subcorpora that we utilized. Uh, learner corpora is second language learners of English, but there's fiction and nonfiction journals and magazines, uh, radio and spoken t uh, un unscripted spoken language, uh, TV English, 273 million words, which is about 100 times larger than the old uh, GSL in terms of corpus size. And we were able to get quite good coverage and uh, you know, for uh, situations that they would meet in their daily life. So how can we do this? Um, why is this possible? Why can we, why are we able to get so few words to provide so much coverage? This has to do with a mathematical principle known as uh, Ziff's Law. And uh, Ziff's Law, I mean, probably reading this, um, especially at 4.30 in the morning, is not going to make much sense to you. But if we read it out, if I read it out loud, frequency decreases with rank. More precisely, frequency is inversely uh, proportional to rank. Um, and again, even reading it once or twice, you might not know exactly what that means. But here, let me show you what it means. Uh, if we put it in chart form, uh, you can see um, there's 600,000 words of, in English at the bottom of the chart. But if you look at what the most, the most frequent word of the English language is the word the. Think about that. The sentence I just said, uh, I used the word the about five times. The most frequent word in the English language is the word the. 7% of all the words you meet on every page of English are the word the. If you know just the top 10 most frequent words of the English language, it gives you about 25% coverage of the words on the page. The top 100, about half. The top 1,000, about 75%. Um, the most frequent words occur over and over again. They occur everywhere. Um, so, um, and, and there's a sharp drop off uh, after the first few thousand. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit easier to, to understand if you look at it in graph form. Um, here's a 10 million word sample of the Cambridge English corpus. And what you can see, uh, this is a randomly selected uh, um, 10 million word sample. And if you were to look at the, the first 2000 most frequent words in that random sample, it would give you 83% coverage. It would be 8.3 million words um, of the 10 million words are 2000, the same 2000 words occurring over and over again. The next 2,000 would give you another 5% coverage. The next 2,000, 3%. Um, so, you know, and that's the point. So knowing 6,000 words here in this case would get you to 90%. So if you're a second language learner or if you're a second language teacher or a materials developer and you're choosing vocabulary words to study or to teach, would you choose the yellow words or the purple words? No, because 2,000 words only gives you 2 or 3% coverage. You would want to 
choose the blue words, right? That's really what the NGSL is. But the NGSL is those blue words on steroids. It's not giving you 83% coverage. It's giving you 92% coverage. So they're very carefully chosen words, core words, foundational words that are very, very important. And you can see the drop off uh, is, is really, really dramatic after those first 2000. And that's called the Ziffian curve, um, that, that drop off. Okay. So what the NGSL is, is it's a collection. There's seven word lists. The yellow one at the bottom uh, is the NGSL, the 2,800 core general English words. And if you look on the left-hand side, you can see 600,000 words. Of those 600,000, the, the first 2,800 are the core daily vocabulary. That's the core foundational words that everybody needs to study. But depending upon um, a student's purpose for studying English, uh, there actually are other shortcuts. So step one is always learning the uh, general English words. That's that's same for almost everybody. But step two will be, you know, can, can be different depending upon the student's purpose. So here we have what are called SP, special purpose or specific purpose uh, word list. And we've created four of them so far, uh, one for academic English, one for TOEIC English, one for business English, and one for fitness English. And very often, um, if these uh, word lists align with your goals, those are very, very uh, efficient um, um, uh, step two. So step one would be the general English, step two would be the special purpose uh, list depending upon your, your purpose. So why do we say that the NGSL is always step one? Because those words are the words that occur everywhere in a student's daily life, in the books and newspapers and magazines, on TV and radio shows, and in conversational English. As I said, 92% coverage for written text, but much higher for listening texts. For example, the TV show Friends are our NGSL gives about 95% coverage. So we, you know, we don't want to teach English just so that they get a good grade on test. We want them to get a good grade on test, but actually what we really want is for them to be able to, to function in the real world. And that's what the NGSL project is, is, is all about, is trying to identify the words they're going to encounter in their daily life. Um, so our goal was not to prepare students for the test, but interestingly, a lot of recent research is showing that the uh, NGSL lists are actually very good for test preparation as well. Um, in Japan, we have uh, a national high school entrance exam, and just knowing the first 1,000 words of the new general service list provides 98% coverage of the vocabulary students need to pass this test. So it's a great list for daily life, but it's also great for this high school entrance exam. Um, there's also a, a center exam for entrance into university. And they, they research has shown that that knowing the new general service list gives 95% coverage for the um, the uh, center exam into national universities. So very good coverage uh, for that as well. And these um, horrible Japanese high school textbooks I was telling you about, one of my graduate students recently did a study and, and, and showed that um, the NGSL gives really good coverage between 93 and 98, 96% coverage for these textbooks as well. So even though the purpose of the NGSL is to be to give very high coverage for real uh, authentic texts in daily life, it also gives very good coverage for these high stakes uh, exams as well. So let's let, let me just I'm going to just take you through not all seven of the list, but I'll take you through just one or two more, and then we'll go on and start looking at some of the gamified uh, tools. Um, the second. Uh, list that we also published in 2013 is known as the new academic word list. And this is academic English. Um, and uh, academic English is a very specialized kind of English. And it's a very, very challenging and difficult kind of English for, for non-native speakers who are um, trying to attend uh, English speaking universities. So say a Japanese student or a Korean student attending the United, uh, a university in the United States, they're suddenly inundated not with daily English, but they're inundated with academic English, the English of academic lectures and academic textbooks. And it's very, very challenging. So what we did is we created a, a corpus of academic 
English as well. And this includes uh, 248 million words from the uh, Cambridge Academic Corpus, but also we, we collected 3 million words of academic lectures uh, split between uh, British academic lectures and American academic lectures. And we also created a corpus of top selling uh, academic textbooks. And this um, 200 and um, what is it? Uh, 283 million word academic corpus. You can see that uh, step one is the NGSL and the coverage drops from 92% to 86% because it's a very specialized, difficult kind of English. But if you study our 960 academic words, it brings you right back up to uh, 92, somewhere between 90 and 92% uh, coverage for these difficult uh, academic texts. And here too, We've got some nice research that that have been done has been un, done independently, and Hendry and Sheepy just published a paper uh, where they created a corpus of five million words of eighteen thousand academic abstracts. Ab academic abstracts are very difficult, uh, filled with difficult English, and it covered you know hundreds of different. Uh, uh, academic genres, and the NGSL and NAWL provided 90% coverage for all of those uh, abstracts. So you can see real life application again is, is pretty good. Um, for the academic English. Now, one of the ones that I, I, you know, we're really proud of is our TOEIC uh, list. And, and TOEIC is supposed to be a test of business English. It's a very high stakes exam that's popular in many Asian countries. Um, and uh, we, you know, we, it's not that we're particular, particularly uh, fans of the of, of the TOEIC word list uh, of the TOEIC test, but we knew that a lot of our students had to pass it. And so we tried to create a corpus of uh, TOEIC English. And we created a 1.5 million word corpus of, of TOEIC English and found that the new general service list is actually a really good uh, first step for uh, TOEIC, giving 94% coverage. And if you study the 1,200 TOEIC words in our TOEIC word list, it goes up to 99% coverage. Um, so that's that's astonishing uh, number. Um, but that's because TOEIC is test English. It's not real English, so it's much more finite, and it's very, it's much easier for us to predict the words. And uh, we recently uh, looked at the latest version of the of the TOEIC test, which changed uh, just maybe about two or three years ago, and we we found that we're still getting ninety eight point five percent coverage. So very very high coverage for the uh, for the TOEIC exam as well. Um, and here, what you can see, this is this is just a sample of modular learning. That's what we're doing. We're trying to create a mix and match system of our word lists uh, so that schools and, and, and content developers and, and, and teachers uh, are able to mix and match our word lists and the, the various levels of our word list uh, to meet the needs of their schools and, 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 and their students. And this is just an example, one example of, of how that might be done. Um, the other, the final list that I just want to mention here uh, directly is our new Dolce list. Um, the uh, the old Dolce list uh, is the list that is often used for young learners of English as a second language. The problem is, is that the old list was not made for the needs of second language learners. It's not even corpus based. 75 year old, 80 year old list, and it wasn't even corpus based and not made for the needs of second language learners. So we, we basically, took the same approach and tried to create a corpus of uh, reading and listening materials that we thought second language learners are likely were li would likely to be meet in their daily lives. And we were able to create a short word list that provides very, very high coverage um, at, at, you know, for, uh, for young learners. And this list is also being uh, utilized around the world as well. Um, so this is sort of a, a summary of all of our, our word lists that we have at the moment. We have new ones coming out uh, in 2024 as well, but you, know, you can see we're teaching general English, academic English, TOEIC and business English, spoken English, children's English and fitness English. And in every case, 90% uh, uh, or higher uh, coverage. And all of these are open source, all of them are free and and all of them are available at our website. Um, I like this slide because this uh, on the left, what you can see is the uh, creators of the original uh, uh, general service list, Michael West, uh, Fawcett and Palmer. And uh, this was this was a picture that was drawn by Michael West's wife uh, of them, you know, 
arguing and discussing and which words should be in the list, which words shouldn't be in the list. As I said, it took 17 years. We've been working on our list for 10 years, and this is my co-authors, uh, Brent Culligan and Joe Phillips, and we're doing, you know, not always over beer, but we're all, we're all, we're doing exactly the same thing. We're constantly uh, updating, constantly revising, constantly discussing and arguing what words should go in and go out. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a process. We're only 10 years into it, and we intend to, you know, keep on innovating and, and, and growing these lists and improving these lists and adding more tools, you know, in the decades to come. Um, so as I said, uh, all of the uh, word lists are open source and free and are available from my website, uh, which is uh, called newgeneralservicelist.com. Um, you can see, that, that, you know, all of the word list and all of our tools um, are available directly uh, from, from, from that website. And what you can see here, this is sort of an overview of not all of the tools, but some of the tools. Uh, we've already talked about the corpora and the word lists. That's what's on the left. Uh, we've also developed a whole bunch of assessment tools, uh, learning tools, and analytical tools. And there's, you know, there's more than a dozen of them, and uh, and it's always it's always being added to. And we'll we'll talk about some of those uh, in, in in the uh, coming slides. Um, so you, if you go to, you know, each word list has its own web page. You can, it's probably hard to see on this screen, but uh, the second pull down says word lists, and if you click on there, uh, there's a dedicated web page for every one of our word lists, and from there you can download the word list and all of, and get access to all of the tools. Um, so you can download, um, you know, just the list itself. You can download uh, what's called a lemmatized list, which gives the word and all of its other forms that are included. Um, we've also taken the time to, you know, because just a word list is not that useful to teachers. Uh, so we tried to write down uh, definitions in easy English for all of the words in all of the lists. That, that took a few years, actually. Uh, but those are also open source and free and downloadable from the uh, website. Um, for researchers, we also um, have Excel sheets that contain all of the raw data about the word list. And those are, are of course, downloadable uh, as well. Well, um, as I said, we've made a couple of different tests. Um, one that's very well known is called NGSLT, the New General Service List Test. Um, and there's also another one called the NAWLT for our academic word list. These were developed uh, by two Japan-based uh, friends of mine, uh, Tim Stokel and Phil Bennett, uh, who are testing experts and have published, you know, probably more than a dozen papers on these tests. They're, they're extremely high uh, reliability and validity, some of the best uh, vocabulary tests in the world, and they're closely uh, related to our two uh, general and academic word lists. These are also uh, open source and freely uh, downloadable uh, from our website. Um, as I said, I, I did a TED talk in 2016 uh, on, on the uh, new general services project. That's also accessible, I think, right from the top page. If you scroll down a little bit, you can get access to that. That's sort of the 10-minute version of the talk I'm giving to you now, so you probably don't need to watch it. Um, <clears throat> There's also, as I said, um, you know, lots of research on the new general service list and our other word lists, and that's available from a, a link on our website. You can um, sort of see, you know, what, what the research articles and what they're about. Um, so now I'd like to move on to uh, some of the uh, learning resources that we have. And um, we've, you know, what we do is we've, we've tried to... Um, may utilize um, open source or free resources that are out there and we've created some of our own as well. Um, so you know basically almost everything that you see will be uh, open source or, or, or free. And um, I'm very interested in the topic of gamification um, because I think this is one way to help to increase um, students' uh, motivation and 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 you know get them more interested in in, in learning vocabulary. One of the problems, uh, for example, and I've, I've designed flashcard apps. Um, you you can create very science based uh, spaced repetition flashcard apps, but students get bored with that. And 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 gamification is a way to help. One way uh, that you can help students to not get bored with. Uh, studying vocabulary can be, which can get very tedious. And so the, the simple definition of gamification is the use of game design elements in non-game context. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, 
And we often talk about this concept of, of, of flow. And that is that if a game is way too easy for a student uh, or a learning task is way too easy, students will get bored. Um, but if it's too hard, they get anxious and that's not good either. So what you're trying to do is to find that zone where students are not bored, but they're not anxious, where they're, they, they, they're in, interested and they're enjoying what they're doing and they forget where they are. Uh, and they're just, they're kind of immersed in the uh, learning experience. And that's, that's called flow. And that's what we're, you know, we hope for. Um, now, uh, connected with this uh, concept of gamification for me is the concept, you know, is the concept of word knowledge. And this is, um, Paul Nation talks a lot about this. I've talked a lot about it. A lot of other people have as well. But um, we, we, you know, there's, uh, Paul Nation has identified more than 20 aspects of word knowledge. So when you say, um, I know this word, what, what does that actually mean? Does it mean that you know the meaning of the word? Or does it mean something more than that? Okay, because knowing a word means you have to know how to, you know what it means, you have to know how to spell it, you need to know how to pronounce it, you know how, need to know how to use it in context, to use it in a sentence, to use it in your writing, to use it in your speech. And so there, there's multiple aspects of word knowledge. And so learning vocabulary is not something that you do once and then it's done. It's something that, that develops over time. And I think, um, you know, we, we often talk about the distinction of receptive knowledge and productive knowledge. And we usually start with receptive knowledge. And many of the resources that I've developed are, are, are designed to, to help with receptive knowledge because that's the starting point. We want students to have a minimum of receptive knowledge for every single NGSL word, every single one of those 2,800 words, they need a minimum of receptive knowledge. But over time, we hope that that will be moved to uh, productive knowledge. And when you look at learning tools now, you know, you know, the, the, the simple ones, you know, we look at when we look at, you know, the, the very well known ones like, 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 like Babel or Duolingo or some of these other ones, they tend to focus on the very, the, the simplest aspect of vocabulary knowledge. Um, and that's a good starting point, but you need over time, you need to do uh, more than that. Um, and that's something to think about and talk about. So in terms of, of gamified tools for the NGSL, um, we have a few. Um, the, the, the Quizlet flashcards and games, um, we, um, we have some flashcards and games that we've made. Um, you know, Kahoot uh, is certainly gamified. Uh, we've just recently, about a year ago, created a Wordle game for the NGSL review. We've got some crossword puzzles and word searches that just sort of help with um, certain aspects of word knowledge. And uh, we've also created a video concordance dictionary uh, that, that, that uses, utilizes the uh, Uglish uh, glossary. And I'll, I'll briefly uh, introduce um, some of these. Um, Quizlet, I think you're familiar with. Um, um, it's a very well-known uh, software, and we adapted Quizlet very early in 2013 when we first published our lists, because in those days, Quizlet was 100% free, and it was gamified. You know, students get points, there's games for learning, there's flashcards for learning. It was great. Um, and uh, so here's, here's some screenshots, um, and these are screenshots of two of the three remaining tools that are still free. There are the, uh, about, even as late as six or eight months ago, there were seven different learning tools that were all free. And, and Quizlet, little by little, is putting more and more of their system behind paywalls and trying to force students and teachers to pay. And so we're a little bit less excited about Quizlet than we used to be. But still, you if you really work at it, you can still use it for free. And there's still three uh, free learning activities. One of them, uh, the one on the left, is the mix and match. Uh, you, you sort of jumble uh, words and definitions and drag them together as quickly as possible. You can see a timer on the left. That timer really helps to gamify this. Uh, students are racing against the clock. They see a leaderboard. Um, they're encouraged to, to try again and get a better time. Uh, my students seem to like it. Uh, it works pretty well. So this is, even though Quizlet is a little bit, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's quite a lot of 
uh, encouragement for you to pay for things. You can still use it for free and there still is some gamification. And we have most of our word lists um, um, are up on Quizlet. We have our own stacks, which you can access directly from our website. But if you just go to Quizlet and search for NGSL or NAWL, there's hundreds and hundreds of stacks created by others as well. So they're very well-known word lists and you can find them there. Um, Memorize is another uh, website that we used to um, direct people to a lot. Uh, it's free flashcards and it used to allow students to personalize their own flashcards, which we thought was very good. And so a lot of our word lists are up on uh, Memorize as well. Uh, same for Kahoot. Um, you know, Kahoot, again, used to be completely free, it was gamified, it was fun. Uh, you know, it, you know, all the students have their cell phones out and they're racing to, to figure out the right definition as quickly as possible. It's a lot of fun. But they too, like, have gone the route of Quizlet and trying to uh, get people to pay for it. So it's a little bit harder to use for free. But, uh, uh, you know, our word lists are are in there um, and it's a lot of fun to use um, even uh, with the, 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 the limited functionality of the, of the free version. And you can see here um, our TOEIC word list, uh, you know, what it looks like up there. And you can see a little bit about how it works. Um, it, it, is, it is gamified and it is fun. Um, and, uh, you know, my students definitely enjoy um, um, you know, practicing uh, vocabulary knowledge uh, utilizing uh, Kahoot. Um, I very early on, maybe 2014 or so, um, I wanted to make sure that uh, if uh, teachers did a search for NGSL or the old GSL uh, on, in the App Store, that there were good flashcard apps for them. And so I made a bunch of free apps uh, for each of our word lists uh, that were based on the concept of spaced repetition. And spaced repetition, I won't go into it in detail right now, but spaced repetition is the idea that you don't study a word just once, that in order to develop short-term memory into long-term memory, you need to be exposed to words several times uh, over increasing intervals. That's why it's called space repetition or time interval learning. And so in my flashcard app, you know, students will see the words after one day, three days, one week, one month. That's the bottom right. And this is done all automatically. The words, they, they choose the words they don't know. They go into flashcard stacks and then this is done kind of uh, automatically. Um, and as I said, I was I was putting out apps uh, in English and in Japanese for Android and Apple for all of these word lists. But I, at one point, I had 16 apps to cover four word lists. And it was just so expensive because they're all free uh, to, to make the apps and then to update the apps. And so we eventually uh, abandoned this approach. Um, they're still out there, um, but we haven't updated these, these apps since 2021. Um, some of them are still there and most of them still work. But for the brand, the latest versions of, of software, some of them might not work as well. So because what we've done is we moved over to creating a single app called the Word Learner app. And in the, in the Word Learner app, you have all of my word lists in a single app. And this has not just flashcards, but it also has vocabulary learning games. So it looks a bit like Quizlet. Um, and so it has gamification. You know, they, they can learn by flashcards, but they can also learn by matching games and, 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 and time uh, games and get points and, and, and things like that. There's also vocabulary placement tests and, and, a, and a little LMS. And uh, the thing that one of the things that we're proud of, it has a 90,000 word uh, uh, learner dictionary uh, where we created uh, 90,000 definitions and sample sentences in easy English. Um, and that's all in the app. And so here's some screenshots of that app. You can see in the second screenshot, there's eight different games. And you can see uh, two of the games in the third and fourth uh, screenshot and then a, a, a screenshot of, of, of the dictionary. And in the dictionary, you can see there's a little plus. So if they look up a word in our dictionary and they say, oh, gee, that's an important word. I think I need to know that. You hit the plus sign and then automatically that's added to their flashcard stack. So they can study the words that they want to study and modify the word lists. Teachers can assign word lists. That's the one on the left. Uh, but students can modify that and add the uh add and study through time interval learning the words that they, they don't know yet. Um, here's a screenshot of our Wordle game. Um, I, you know, I, I, I just got, I, I was just sort of intrigued when Wordle first came out. Um, how popular uh, it got to be uh, worldwide. It seemed to be a worldwide phenomenon, and it was fun. I, I tried it myself, and I thought, well, you know, maybe we can do something 
like Wordle with the NGSL. And so what we did is we, we created an NGSL version of Wordle, which can be accessed from our website. You can see the screenshot on the left. That's our interactive learner dictionary. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, if you click on Wordle, uh, what it will do is uh, you can see usually Wordle is for five letter words only. But what we've done, uh, because we wanted to review as much of the NGSL as possible, is we made we created a version that allows review of four, five, and six letter words. I think on the next screenshot, yeah, here you, see, you can see it. Um, if we include four, five, and six letter words of the NGSL, that gives you uh, about 1,400 of the 2,800. So about half of the NGSL. NGSL is available for uh, review through this uh, NGSL Wordle game. And this can, this can be kind of fun. Um, be, with second language learners, Wordle can be a little bit more challenging. So normally what, we, you know, what I do when I'm playing Wordle with my students is I take them to our interactive learner dictionary. And there's a, you can see there's a search box uh, right above where it says Wordle circled. And what students can do is they can work in pairs uh, with NGSL Wordle and help each other. And then, you know, say the, the A and the I are in green and they've got, they, 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 under, they know that A and I is part of the word, but they don't know the rest of the word. They can put A and I in the search box and then all of the NGSL words with A and I will pop up. And it's sort of kind of like a learning strategy and getting them to guess, getting them to think, developing critical thinking skills. And so by putting the NGSL online interactive dictionary next to Wordle, uh, you can create a kind of a fun uh, interactive uh, um, learning activity for your students. Um, I'm also um, very into um, uh, uh, trying to teach vocabulary in context where possible and also into trying to develop a collocational knowledge. Uh, that is, um, you can't, you don't, you can't just study a word in isolation. You need to know what that word often occurs with. So if we know, if we study the word uh, birthday, uh, a collocate for birthday is happy, happy birthday, right? So students need to know not just the word birthday, they need to know the collocates. They need to see the word in in context. And uh, a really great resource that I became aware of maybe four or five years ago was, was Youglish. And Youglish um, is like a corpus of YouTube videos and TED Talks. And, um, you know, it's got thousands and thousands of videos. And what they've done is they've created a system where you can search for any word and it will instantly create a playlist of of that word as it occurs in, in, in hundreds, if not thousands of different videos. And it will play like a, a five second clip of the TED talk that you can see on the right, the word abstract, the NGSL word abstract. Uh, you can see it says how to pronounce abstract in English it says one out of 12,846. That means there's 12,000 videos with the word abstract. And what you can do, if you hit the play button, you'll see abstract in a TED talk because government is not an abstract institution or a concept. And then if you hit the uh, fast forward button, it instantly goes to the next video with abstract in it and then fast forward. And then within like a, a minute, you can give your students or students by themselves can see 10 or 12 or 15 different clips of that word being used in authentic content, uh, concept, uh, contexts. And so again, this is another free resource that we've created. And you can see on the left-hand side, this is our interactive learning dictionary um, the word abstract is circled on the left um, you could if, if you if you click on the word in, in, the, in the left hand column that instantly takes the student or the teacher to the Youglish uh, clip list for that word. So that's that's one of the resources. But you can see, I'm not going to go into all of them, but if you can see another column for pronunciation, that takes you to another website that has great pronunciation uh, information on, on all of these words. Uh, and you can, so for example, if you clicked on abstract, you would be taken to a website that shows how abstract is pronounced by native speakers of American English, British English, Australian English, and so on. Um, and then you can see a uh, definition. We've written down a definition, but you can also see all those icons. That's six different uh, or seven different online dictionaries. And students can look at our definition, but they can compare that to um, the definitions on online dictionaries uh, as, as, as well. 
Um, we've also created uh, NGSL crossword puzzles, and uh, we I think we also have NAWL as well. So these are our, our randomly uh, uh, created crossword puzzles based on these word lists to uh, further develop uh, students' knowledge of uh, of the uh, of the words. Uh, word search. It sounds like a very uh, simple uh, activity, but word searches are actually part of the early stage of receptive knowledge because being able to recognize a word is very important. So the word criminal is circled. Uh, word searches helps you to recognize uh, words more quickly. And we often talk about the concept of automaticity uh, as being important in second language learning. So it's not just enough to learn a word, but it has to become automatic. Automaticity means automatic, right? So we, we need to learn to, you know, we, we need to not just uh, learn a word so that it takes two or three seconds to recall what it means. That's too slow. Uh, we want it to be almost instantaneous. That's what happens with native speakers. So as students continue on their journey of, of building their vocabulary, higher frequency words should become more automatic and they should be able to, to understand the knowledge and recognize those words more quickly. And word searches actually helps with one aspect of automaticity. So we put that up as, as well. Um, so what's what's next? Um, we've, you know, as I said, we've got uh, seven word lists. We've just done a major update uh, to the NGSL 1.2 version. Uh, that was just completed about two or three uh, months ago. So all of our word lists have been updated. As I said, they're continually being updated. The old the old general service list, it took 17 years before they had a final version of the old GSL. We're 10 years into the new general service list, and about every two or three years, we we do an update based on, on you know, as I said, I'm presenting at conferences around the world. I'm getting feedback from linguists, feedback from teachers. Uh, people are publishing papers. And, you know, so we're having these discussions, having these arguments, and, 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 and that's all helping us to improve the list over time. So all of the 1.2 updates were just done a few months ago. Um, I just did. I just completed a, a full update of the NGSL website, so things should be a little bit easier to find. That was done a few months ago. The old website was really long in the tooth, so that was that was very much needed. Um, we've been, had a lot of requests for a TOEFL word list. That's something we're working on right now. Um, a TV word list, uh, because um, th there's a lot of research to show that, that second language learners are far more likely to be exposed to listening materials in English rather than reading materials in English. I know there's a big push for extensive reading, and I have my own free extensive reading website called ER Central, um, which is not the topic of today's uh, talk. But um, as important as extensive reading is, extensive listening is more what happens for second language learners. They're they're listening to TV shows, listening to movies, listening to radio, listening to podcasts. And so we've decided that we're going to create a TV word list. Uh, the corpus work is already done, and we just have to finalize that, and that should be out by early 2024. We've also got a, a literature word list because, especially in, in Japan and many other uh, countries, uh, students learn English in departments of literature. Uh, that Corpus is already done. Um, that word list should be out also in 2024. Um, the NGSL 2.0, uh, which is connected to the TV word list, uh, this is uh, a major update. Uh, that should be done next year, where about 50% of the corpus will be listening. Um, and we also have a few new textbook series that are going to be based on the uh, new general service list and some workbook series as well. So this is, let's see, so I think I'm just about five minutes early, which is exactly how I was hoping it would be to, to give a few minutes uh, for uh, uh, discussion with you and, and any questions that you have, I, I might be able to answer. So uh, thank you very much for sticking with me through this, this, this one hour talk on my, my word list project. Uh, you can see that we've been very busy and we have a lot more things that are just around the corner. And our hope is that these uh, free resources will be of use to you in your teaching and in, in, in your content development um, and, 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 you know, in, in your journey into teaching and, and, and learning English. So thank you uh, very much. Great. Thanks, Charles. That was a fantastic presentation. Really, really interesting stuff. And I can see that there are tons of questions. We're not going to have a ton of time to get to sure. many of them, but why don't we try to answer 
potentially oh, one or I two. Did, let me let me drink for my Ellie. Yes, please do. <laughs> okay, why don't we take a look at this first question here, which says, I wonder if there is a frequency list for idioms as well. So it's a really it's a really good question, and it's it, it's a really important uh, it's a really important topic. I mean, it's something that that um, Rob Waring and I, um, my my partner with the uh, extensive reading website ER Central, um, have been working on as well. Um, and so you know, it's you know, de definitely that's something that can be done. Um, you know, you just need to you know for you know you need a list of idioms and we have that and then what you need to do is to compare that list of idioms within a, a corpus that is relevant to second language learners and it's something that we're in the process of doing i think eventually it will be published but i think that's very important uh, because very often what i see is that you know when i look at textbooks uh that include idioms it seems to be taught in a very haphazard way and very uh, idiomatic english is actually quite uh, difficult, quite challenging, quite complex. And so I think that the same approach to teaching idioms needs to be made that we use for teaching uh, single word units. And that is letting frequency uh, guide our decisions about the order of teaching. We need to, you know, we need to teach the idioms that they're most likely to encounter before these really, really, you know, strange or unusual ones that they're not likely to meet. But that that definitely is around the corner. And that's the same for phrasal verbs as well, idioms and phrasal verbs. Interesting, phrasal verbs, that would be a good one. <laughs> nice. Uh, okay, maybe one more, I know we're pushing it, but it's nice to answer a couple of questions. So this was another popular question. How does NGSL compare to CEFR? Zephyr, yeah. So yeah. That's, a, that's a great question. It's one that's often asked at my sessions, and um, we've you know we've looked at it. Um, there's a good correlation. There's an overlap, of course. Um, all of our NGSL words are you know are in in Zephyr, but the problem is is that that Zephyr is either the purpose of Sefer and the purpose of the NGSL is, is quite different. Uh, what we are trying to do is to be a short, tight, efficient list of the words that are mo you know, basically the words that are going to give students most bang for the buck. So what can you do with 2,000 or 3,000 words is going to help you to read and listen to and understand English in as many situations as possible. What Sefer is doing is almost the opposite. It's trying to predict all of the words that you would need in every possible situation at every Sefer level. So when you look at Sefer vocabularies, there's no official Sefer vocabularies, but if you look at, for example, the, the Pearson list or the Cambridge list, a lot of the big publishers have tried to reverse engineer the vocabulary lists. They're, you know, the, the large lists are 10, 15, 20,000 words, which is impossible for second language learners. As you can see from my earlier slides, after 12 years, Japanese learners only have 2,000 words. So 20,000 words is, you know, that's 100 years work, which is impossible. So what we're, our mission is different. I mean, we there, there's absolutely an overlap, but we are not trying to, you know, to be a Sefer list. That would, that would change the, you know, the, the purpose of the NGSL project from efficiency to, you know, complete coverage. Um, but it, you know, they, definitely every one of the NGSL words in all of our word lists appears somewhere in Sefer for sure. Great. Excellent. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions now. But um, you can head over to the presenter table right after this. We're going to have 15 minutes. And uh, Charles will be there at the presenter yes. table. So you can go there and ask him your questions. Before we wrap up, we are going to draw our winner for this session, and the winner will be getting, can you show us that wonderful mug? It's a great cup. I use it every day. I, I got this about a month ago, and it's my favorite coffee cup. So yeah, yeah, I hope you'll get one of these. There you bright, go. Bright and cheery colors. Nice. All right, let's see who our winner is. I'm just going to show this on stage. And Charles, if you could read for us. Uh, the winner of this guest speaker session is Jamie S. from the USA. Woo Congratulations, Jamie. So we will be in contact with you soon to organize your prize. And the last thing that I want to do before we break away for our mix and mingle is just to take a look at our leaderboard and see who is currently leading. 
Let's share that in the chat. And there it is. You can also click on that bot the button that says check your rank to see where you are. But those are our top three people right now at this moment. However, there is still time. You've got 15 minutes to get a couple more points. Um, so make sure you do that. And you can also still answer the event attendee survey. We will be drawing a winner for a one year subscription to Ellie in our wrap up session coming up in 15 minutes. So thank you everyone. It's time to grab a seat at the table. As I said, you've got 15 minutes and then coming up next, we've got our wrap up session led by our CEO and founder, Ben Buckwald. Thank you everyone for being here. And thank you, Charles. That was a really great presentation. Thank, thank you so much. It was great to be here. Okay, great. See you soon. Ellie.